Um, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my brother, Bantin Fellow here, uh, Martin, um, who together were the two Bantin uh, Fellows for Carlton um, two years ago, right? How time flies. Yeah, so um, the, the Institute of African Studies is very well located, and I have had um, general support, you know, all around, and I would like to acknowledge that. The Bantin Postdoctoral Fellowship has given me opportunity to expand my work uh, beyond the scope that I had actually planned. Uh, but what it has also done is that it's, it's simply complicated my life in many ways. <laughs> Uh, because I was on the run uh, with what I thought was, um, you know, a good project. And I could very well have ended that project focusing ent exclusively on Nigeria with, you know, the kind of comparative analysis that I do without necessarily having to visit um, some other cities. But the Banting has given me opportunity to um, do um, a more comparative ethnographic um, engagement with what I call street stories. And so that allows me, I have been to Accra, I plan to go to um, some of the other hubs that I am looking at, which is uh, Nairobi in Kenya and uh, Johannesburg in South Africa. Uh, what I have done with this, uh, when I had the opportunity to elect either to participate in this brown bag or not, I gave it um, second thoughts, you know, realizing how crazy this time of the year is for me, and I'm sure Bant, um, Martin can also bear out, you know, we're at the tail end, and there are reports and a whole lot of other things that needs to be rounded up. But it just turned out to be a great gift to me, because uh, this brand back talk has given me an opportunity to investigate something that has just been there. You know, it's been there for a while, it's been going on for a while. And being somebody who is very interested in popular cultural production, I had taken note of it, but not at a purely scholarly level. And so when um, I was exchanging with Dominique, and I said, crazy, I could just as well look at what this holds, you know. And I chose this topic. And in the course of investigating uh, this topic and preparing for it, I found out that it's still very much of a virgin area in the sense that as we speak, I do not see that there is any publication on this. And so it presents a lot of opportunity, and I'm hoping that, um, depending on the feedback and how far I take this, I'm actually looking to carry on, because I've, I've uh, written a substantial part of it already as an essay, you know, just carrying on and going ahead to conclude the paper for publication a few weeks after now. Um, and so the title is uh, The Adventures of Our Boss. Uh, I have a handout that I've passed around. Uh, if you're coming in now, you just might not be able to read it, but it's a quick read. And what it does is um, I found this very, very interesting. Um, it it's virtually summarizes the nature of the material that I'm dealing with uh, from a personal perspective, not my personal perspective, but somebody else's perspective, you know, somebody who lives in the Netherlands. Uh, she's a trained economist, but she writes a blog. And she's a compulsive blogger. I mean, any day she doesn't write, it's like something has gone out of, the, as if a door has pulled out of the hinges. And looking at this, I found this very fascinating. So I picked, she designed this cover. I, this is more like um, a stub um, for the journalism students in the house. Um, it's more like a stub because it's not an actual newspaper. And so I found this really fascinating and I got her permission. She is very strict. Even if she's blogging, she seems to be so strict about the uses of her material and wants her link to go with everything um, as a feedback. So I got this and then I looked at this letter. The import of this letter is significant in the sense that at this time in Nigeria, there are lots of open letters being written. Um, the most controversial being from a former head of state of Nigeria, a former president to the sitting president. And so this has opened up you know, a new genre, not a new one. It has reintroduced an old genre, you know, or renewed an old genre of letter writing into public consciousness at a time where everybody is you know, obsessed with the internet and with uh, Blackberry and so on and so forth. And so um, you will go through this. Now, what I plan to do with this talk is, because this is exploratory and at the same time, the material is very complicated, working through several uh, multiple media platforms. I cannot, I cannot judiciously tackle this within the time available, right? 
And then, so what I plan to do is twofold. I'm going to give um, a very short reading from here that just contextualizes uh, my research into this. And then I'll move on um, very quickly. I'm going to speed through my PowerPoint presentation because what it does is that it gives me opportunity to um, describe the material that I'm working with since they exist in the multiple um, media platforms I'm talking about. It's multimedia, so I would like you to have a feel of it, to have a sense of it, you know, as it moves from print, you've seen one that I've circulated, you know, into other forms. And so I will go through it, and I hope that at the end I will give you um, a quick sense of the kind of material uh, that I'm working with and where I am taking this to and hopefully the significance of the research. And so the title, right from the title, um, you could see some of the uh, challenges that pop up. I have two spellings of our boss right there in the title, uh, represented by the bracket. Some, of, some people spell it as A-K-W, excuse me, A-K-P-O-S, without the R. If you're familiar, any student of linguistics, you know, familiar with some African languages, we know that uh, spellings can be very problematic because there isn't really standard orthography for some of the languages. And so, um, and then more so with this kind of material that exists in Nigerian pidgin for the most part, even if there are also people who write them in standard English. And so, and then it's also material that is being written by so many people under one banner. So you can imagine the kind of chaos, you know, the, the kind of chaotic material I'm trying to put a sense to and to find a single narrative, you know, a thread connecting these disparate images and disparate uh, representations of um, slices of Nigerian life around the metaphor of Akbos. And so some spell it A-K-P-O-S. If you went searching for it, you'll find, you find this. And then some spell it as A-K-P-O-R-S. This would be more anglicized, you know, with the R being introduced. And so the adventures of Akbos, the maverick, um, street stories, humor, and the Nigerian digital imaginary. So um, I'll begin with an epigraph from an essay, uh, which I'm very much indebted to um, as I begin to theorize this cultural phenomenon called a boss. Whenever and wherever individuals and groups deploy and communicate with digital media, there will be circulations, reimaginings, magnifications, deletions, translations, revisionings, and remakings of a range of cultural representations, experiences, and identities. But the precise ways that these dynamics unfold can never be fully anticipated in advance. In some instances, digital media have extended their reach into the mundane heart of everyday life, most visibly with cell phones. Gadgets now vital to conduct, um, to conduct business affairs in remote areas of the world, as well as in bustling global cities. In other instances, Digital artifacts have helped engender new collectivities. And this is um, Gabriela Coleman. It could not have, end of quote, it could not have been accidental that from the country that produced, and I quote, Africa's first popular written literature, which is also known as Onicha market literature, and the continent's largest contemporary film industry called Nollywood has materialized Africa's most phenomenal viral narrative around the adventures of a single character in the digital age, at boss. Although the narrative imagination is universal, and scholars have indeed conducted insightful studies of the peculiarities of Africa's storytelling traditions informed by its rich oral culture, and I have in mind scholars like Abiola Irele, Isidok Bewa, and so on and so forth. There is an urgent need to focus attention on the specific social cultural experience as well as the textual practices that have influenced the proliferation of such unique popular cultural production from that country. And that's my country, Nigeria. And while studies of nature market literature and Nollywood relatively abound, there is virtually none on what I call the still evolving urban street narrative culture in the digital age in Africa. This brown bar talk offers me an opportunity to call a wider attention to and to inaugurate the much in their critical discourse of an aspect of the popular urban narratives, a boss, the maverick. For perhaps no other character outside of the well-known folkloric tortoise of the oral tradition fame in Africa 
has commanded such compelling attention in the popular narrative imagination in Nigeria than at us. Far from Onisha, market literature and Nollywood are associated with localized production around Onisha, uh, and then Upper Iweka area to be specific of the city. And for Nollywood, both Onisha and Lagos, uh, and then they also clustered around um, the areas of the city called Idumabu and Alaba International Market. The utmost narrative phenomenon has seized the Nigerian digital imaginary at home and in the diaspora. More than any other form of cultural production that I am aware of, the adventures of Akbos enjoys a unique and enigmatic production system. And this is what it's like. It is communally produced and circulated, crossing borders and social class through mobile digital devices, evolving in a stunning fashion with its authorship dissolving like mist as it is transmitted across cyberspace. Unlike the producers of its analog, and I'm using this advisedly, analog narrative precursor in the form of an each market literature, producers of outburst narratives defy easy classification. They are not the kind of semi-literate or illiterate traders who produce the initial market literature, and about whom Tomed so condescendingly describes in his important collection, Life Turns Man Up and Down, published in 2001. And I quote this very condescending description. These authors and their facilitators cater to a reading public with newly discovered romans are enthusiastically embracing literacy. Here, and then you can't believe this, in demotic, uncooked, mad English, composed by illiterate printers in broken type, newsprint bound in bush bruise wraps and distributed from hand to mouth, is a political literature's growing pains and on display, end of quote. The producers and consumers of the above narratives, as I prefer to call the constellation of various narratives with multiple authorship scattered across multiple media platforms from BlackBerry and other portable digital devices, include the not so least literate as well as the most learned professionals, like the woman I talk about who is an economist, um, based in the in Netherlands. What brings them into conversation is a compulsive interest in storytelling and the comic or humorous in a society where stand-up comedy, uh, like Made in Worry, Night of a Thousand Loves, and the rash of stand-up acts, uh, stand-up acts, DVDs, and shows, has become a huge industry and favorite pastime for dealing with deliberating social conditions of everyday life. They are generally young and middle-aged, students, bankers, professors, politicians, traders, commercial bus drivers, and artisans who operate with considerable access to mobile smartphones in a country, in a country with over 90 million people or about twice the population of Canada with mobile phones, approximately 7 million on Facebook and other social media. So the absence of any studies of the above phenomenon so far is understandable. Beyond the acknowledgement of the slippery nature of popular arts in Africa by one of its pioneer scholars, Karim Baba, E. Gabriela Coleman has insightfully noted that despite a massive, and I'm quoting her, despite a massive amount of data and new forms of visibility shored up by computational media, many of these walls remain veiled, cloaked, and difficult to decipher. She points out, and I quote again, Long-term ethnographic research is well suited to tease out some of these veiled dimensions, however tentatively, to unearth the remarkable depth, richness, and variability of digital media in everyday and institutional life. This paper is inspired by the need to rise up to the challenge of fulfilling such intellectual and progressive challenge. And so at this point, I will just um, move back to my PowerPoint because I just have set the tone. And, um, yeah, I uh, would we'll, uh, try and fit this into the time. Uh, we might not be able to take many of the clips or um, you know, examples of this kind of narrative or material, uh, but you, know, um, you can always look up the internet, and I have links that I can also share with whoever is interested. And so some key definitions, uh, because sometimes we take certain words for granted, especially in titles, or in, you know, um, so I thought that um, I have carefully chosen the word maverick, and some people might just be wondering what's maverick about at most. And I thought I'll call attention again to these uh, definitions of the Merriam-Webster dictionary. You know, a person who refuses to follow the customs or rules of a group. And then it goes on to say, you know, some of these um, uh, parenthetical definitions. 
full definition of maverick, an unbranded range animal, especially a motherless calf. And then two, an independent individual who does not go along with a group or party. This definition fits into our boss in many ways, and at the same time, he explodes these definitions in different, because um, he is branded, and yeah, he is unbranded. In fact, there's a lot of antithesis around, around the character at boss. Um, and then he is independent, he's an independent individual. But is it so much of an individual? It's written by a group of people, by several people in different, and it has character that is not so much, um, you know, uh, let me say, in fact, we'll be doing at boss a lot of good if we say that it's a complex character. You know, because characterization becomes difficult if you are approaching this from a literary perspective. You know, i.e., you expect certain kind of consistency. But human beings are also inconsistent. And so you find out boss because it's being written by different people. Sometimes it's operating outside of um, our conception of him in a way that if you were a novelist or a short story writer, you would appear to have forgotten, you know, the general trend of your character. If you wrote over some, some period of time and then you have to get back to see, oh, what kind of character was Jane in, um, in chapter one or early in the, in the story? So uh, you get that kind of feeling. And then I thought again, because street stories was a very difficult kind of thing to describe. And I wanted to um, hack back to um, the earlier uh, research on this. Um, I conceived the term street stories as part of a larger work in progress to describe mythopoic or mythopoetic oral text produced and circulated as weapons of political reasons or compromise in multiple cultural formations within the post-colonial state, um, especially in the metropolis with its complex demographics. With, Abbas, with the Abbas narrative, the social dimensions enter into the conversation. But there's also the political. Much of what I have been doing with the work that my Bantin and then my ongoing larger research and monograph is looking at the political elements. Um, but this is just thrown up, as I said earlier on, as a gift because it gives me an opportunity to look at the social um, angle of this whole conversation. And then humor, we can also take humor for granted. But perhaps the most revealing study of the place of humor in contemporary Nigeria is the Bene Zabada race, uh, the uses of radical humor, infra politics, and civil society in Nigeria. Very fascinating study. The essay explores, a, and I quote, the powerful symbolism of humor as a social technique. According to Obadere, jokes expensive or cheap, have generally been used by the disprivileged, and this is a very beautiful word, I really like that, by the disprivileged, to carry culture those in power, subvert authority, and in some instances empower themselves. And I go on to observe that in traditional African society, the bad who delights in subtle rebadry is, is, um, is a famous, if notorious, presence. Obadari, you know, essay describes and analyzes how, quote, ordinary citizens in Nigeria are using humor both in coping with social asperities as well as negotiating, shaping, and redefining the public domain of critical deliberation. But sadly, he missed our boss in that beautiful essay. Uh, and this is part of what um, my um, study you know, um, hopes to introduce into the conversation because I think that our boss presents a late motif, one of the most compelling ways to examine this kind of role of humor in society. And then also to look at you know, what um, I call digital imaginary, which I would also explain what I mean or what I'm thinking about. This is a contest that humor operates in the Apple's narratives beyond crass entertainment. Of course, crass entertainment is, is part of it. The Apple's jokes, if you're reading Apple's jokes all by yourself, and then also depending on, uh, because um, humor or jokes can also be cultural. Sometimes you know, people from some kind of place might crack what's a joke and they fall flat you know, because you cannot connect with it. And then in some other cultural context, you know, you find people reeling on the floor. But I doubt that you can deal with that boss without, without reeling on the floor, or uh, using that R-O-F-L, you know, that um, some of those, I'm sure some of our friends are already laughing, you know, you know, R-O-F-L. These are the kind of shortcuts and short forms of expression that is so prominent in the kind of material we're working in. And so, um, so digital imaginary. I am thinking here in terms of Jeffrey J. Cook's uh, present, and I'll quote, present day generation of new self and body images in the new conceptual territories available in modern cultural and telecommunications interspaces. So it, it's rather complex, you know, because um, one, it's imagination, and two, is visible and invisible. And so these are the interspaces 
or um, those um, crossing borders that you think of, you know, within the mind and also physical location of these uh, citizens. Also not what is Coleman's um, germane observation, and then I quote, although the term digital media may be familiar to most readers, it is worth highlighting that digital media encompasses a wide range of non-analog technologies, including cell phones, the internet, and software applications that power and run on the internet, amongst others. So when we have this um, perhaps more embracing definition of the digital imaginary and the way I'm thinking about it, you will understand why the kinds of devices, you know, and the kind of uh, multimedia platforms that I'm thinking about will come into play. So, and then this is the essay, you know, if you're interested in this topic, this is a fantastic essay. Um, so the origins of the Atmos narratives. Now, um, at this point, I think I just might make a, a, a small observation about my methodology. You know, I have already described this in my, in my preface, and at the same time, it's beginning to emerge from what I'm saying. But I have had to um, adopt something that is a bit radical, you know, in terms of I have used some kind of open sourcing. Perhaps let me, because I deal with that um, at the, you know, in, a, in a few slides after this, so let me progress with that but you'll see the connection that I'm trying to make about the origin of the Akbar's narratives. First, there's the influence of oral tradition. And I found out, okay, part of, let me let it cut out the bag. What I did in trying to deal with this very slippery material in which there is virtually no theorizing, you know, available right now, is to see the way some of the producers of this material work with it and how they see it. And then it's also contentious, you know, the, it's controversial, the origin. Where, 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 what is the provenance of these Akbar's narratives? There's a single, the Akbar's narrative, let's remember again, is there are series of stories, vignettes, and so on and so forth about a particular character written by several people, many of whom you do not know their authorship. All of them imagining what this character can do, what he's capable of doing. And everybody's writing, Akbar's did this, Akbar's did that. In other words, you know, there's this, a certain kind of you know, um, uh, virtual symposium going on around this character. So it's, it's still an evolving story. And so there is the influence of oral tradition. And then I found, so I put this on Facebook and said, OK, you know, I'm interested in this. Um, what do you think about that boss? And um, I have the question that I post to um, the social media community, and especially those of my friends on Facebook. Partly because of my work as a journalist and, um, you know, as well as um, the uh, General Secretary of the Writers Guild in Nigeria, I have, I, before I knew it, I had over 5,000 friends on Facebook and I couldn't take any. So I had to delete so many uh, so that I can accommodate people. That, and so I continued to do that. And when I set this up, I knew what I was getting into because I had lots of this and I also made it public. I didn't restrict it to friends. So I started getting a lot, of, um, a lot of people joining the conversation, one of whom is this guy, James Yeku. I have never met him, but he's um, a doctoral student at the um, University of Saskatchewan. And then he writes back to me to say, oh, this is fascinating, that he actually presented a paper at the Institute of African Studies um, in Ibadan on this title, Ijapa on Facebook, uh, was a strict star figure. And this clicked because this was the original idea of what I was thinking about for this, for this uh, particular presentation. Thank God I, I left that area. Um, yes, what it immediately does, it points to the idea. Ijapa is the tortoise in Yoruba. In Igbo language, it's Mbe. And it's a very dominant figure in folklore, you know, and the folk tales in, in Africa. And so he has this. So they, that, that essay you know, um, maps how the relationship between the oral, oral literature, oral tradition, and the Akbos. And, so, and then I have already spoken about Onisha market literature. The Onisha market literature were pamphlets that were produced you know, in Onisha um, several years ago. And um, one scholar did his PhD at Cambridge on, on this Onisha market literature. And that's how he was introduced into the world more like the way uh, we're trying to do with the Akbos uh, narrative. And so uh, the kind of imagination that shapes the Akbos narrative, sometimes even language seems to be um, you know, a legacy from Manisha market literature. This has also been implicated in the home video in the Nollywood uh, presentations. And so there's popular cultural analogy. And some of you might know uh, Little Johnny, Little Jimmy, Dennis the Menace. You know, these are some of the characters that share some kind of DNA with Akbos. And I'm sorry, I might not be able to go into details describing all of these um, 
uh, things so that I can, I can um, quickly uh, be able to accommodate the survey. And so there is also Fun Times comic in the 1980s Nigeria with the adventures of Bembela and Lulu created by David Lasheko. Lash and other cartoon sketches in the defunct Daily Times and other publications. So there have been some kind of, these are characters, cartoon strips, like, um, like uh, Little Jimmy or Dennis the Menace, which begin to evolve. You know, somebody creates one particular and then people begin to take different angles of, you know, to it, begins to produce films. And before you know it, it's gone completely well. At this time where Little Jimmy, uh, Little um, Johnny and so on and so forth, you know, we haven't had a kind of digital media that we have now that automatically makes things viral, you know, within, uh, within seconds through instantaneous sharing. Um, and so then, the, so there's a comic nature to this already implicated by the kind of uh, provenance, you know, that I associate with Atmos. And then Atmos's uh, minor precursors also include Boy Alinko, Papa Jasko, Miss Pepe, all of Ikeba, Ikebe Super, and um, super story fame. I see one or two people smiling here, which tells me that some people are familiar with the references that I'm making. These are very humorous um, festival cartoon comics, and then later being turned into film, and then also into um, TV drama. So they keep evolving. There's a metamorphosis that goes on with some of this material out of the public uh, obsession with materials like this. And so there's Dauda, the sexy guy of Lolly magazine. Um, so many people of the younger generation in, or the present day in Nigeria might not even remember these guys. You know, in the process of putting this together, I've had to you know, remember them and then to do quick searches and to find ways to connect them with this. And so the Atmos phenomenon is not, uh, is not completely without any antecedents, although with Atmos narratives, uh, we reach another level altogether. Then there's the maiden worry theory. This is part of the response that I get. The maiden worry, you know, is that worry, uh, which is a part of Nigeria and the Niger Delta area. And um, questions on methodology for researching this is the role of Facebook and social media and the controversial issues of crowdsourcing and open um, course, open source. Oh, I got this bad. Yeah, um, that should be S there. So I should have put another bracket S there. Course and source, you know, uh, which is still very controversial in academia. Um, as new marketplaces for ideas. And so, um, as I said, there's this conversation that I, I, I initiated on Facebook, and I got really fascinating responses about uh, the origins of our wars and so on and so forth, some of which I'll be fleshing out in the essay proper. And then, you know, just to give you an idea, this is the map of Nigeria highlighting the Niger Delta area. That's this area here. And then worry is just somewhere here. Um, here. This is Delta, this is old Bendel. This, this is the old map, and then this has been carved, and then you have Delta, and then, and then a do state out of it. This, you know, is seen as one of the largest um, deltas in the world, you know, um, wetland and, and um, creeks and so on and so forth. And, you know, um, incidentally, is the oil bearing part of Nigeria, and where a lot of the insurgency is going on with regards to kidnapping of uh, foreign oil workers and some local workers, which has in turn spawned, you know, imitators who are now also kidnapping people for ransom, you know. And so this is a place because the guys here, uh, which is one of the most despoiled, environmentally devastated area of the country, that produces the wealth of the country. Nigeria is a monocultural; over ninety percent or thereabout of Nigerians' income comes from crude oil. And, you know, these places are very bad, you know. Um, it led to the hanging of Kensaruba because there's acid rain and a whole lot of things going on here. Because of the location of this place too, um, there's early contact with Europeans and so on and so forth. And this is the heartland of the Nigerian pigeon. You know, so uh, you can easily substitute Nigerian pigeon with the idea of Wafi, Wafi language, you know, which is uh, the local name for Wari. Uh, so Wari is there. Uh, that's where worry is located. I just thought to give you this. And of course, you know, this map shows Nigerians' borders, you know, Niger, Chad, so many countries bordering Nigeria. And this also accounts for the, for the way the transmission of these stories rapidly as people travel, because um, a whole lot of Nigerians also travel for different reasons. And so sometimes, some statistics, um, I thought we should just pull this up very quickly. Nigerian population, one around 70 million. Um, cell phone subscribers, 90 million people. A reasonable percentage of whom carry two or three cell phones. Um, it's not unlikely to find some people actually carrying four cell phones 
because of the wretched nature of the services, you know, in some places it's not fine. Made. And so uh, you can imagine how also people depend on these cell phones for transmission of, you know, vignettes and short narratives like the Atmos narratives. And then um, the statistics also indicate that there are 48 million um, internet users. And then Facebook has about 6.5 million. And I was surprised, in, well, I'm not surprised. Um, that yesterday I learned from a news item that 1.35 billion people use Facebook monthly, uh, which is part of its 10th anniversary information released only yesterday. And then the most widely spoken English uh, language in Nigeria is a, is a pidgin, but there are over 250 languages and ethnic groups. And so um, you saw the area where the pidgin is. The pidgin also happens to be the dominant language of the Atmos narratives. And so if you read some of them, you, know, you might not um, fully understand them because it's Nigerian pidgin. And then there's yet to be a standard orthography. So even if you know the language, uh, the spellings differ, and then they are written because they are also using mobile devices composed. There are different kinds of short forms, you know, some of them very laughable, you know, that you can find on some extremely creative. And then so the, at this point, I'd like to just give you a sense of some of the materials that I am I'm dealing with so you can just um, have an idea. So there's viral multimedia narrative formats. The narratives are taken um, some of these forms. And I found this. This is one of Nigerians' leading comedians. His name is AY, and he has a channel. And then he says that, you know, uh, look at the notes published on August 22, 2012 by AY Comedian. And he has on YouTube 255 videos, many of them comedies. And he also has uh, CDs. I have some of his CDs here. So I brought some of these, sorry, DVDs. Um, you'll be so amazed at what these DVDs cover, from Blackberry Babes, Twitter Babes, you know, dealing with the, how uh, post-colonial Africa is dealing with modernities and the new, new technologies. It's so fascinating, really. You won't believe the range of DVDs and cultural production that comes out from Africans' engagement with the, new, with the new modernities starting from the late 20th century. And so I have this, and then we'll quickly, and then it says you need to watch how Apos uses a worry pigeon to anchor the show of who wants to be a billionaire. Can you beat this? This is a Western construct that is now being domesticated. And it's just so hilarious. And then it says category, comedy, drama, entertainment. And this fits in. You know, um, so let's see. I don't know why this link. Oh, good. Um, so I will quickly show us this. It's an eight-minute video, but we can't take all of it. So just to give you a sense. Yes, the light, please. Come on. It just seems to be so slow. I hope I haven't lost my internet connection. Okay, there it is. Oh, something is going on. I think uh, it's freezing. Okay. Okay, I can skip now. There's a program, you know, some of you are familiar with who wants to be a millionaire, and then he domesticates this and has a boss play the role. Um, that's how ingenious, you know, this narrative uh, format is. Yeah, it's freezing. Unfortunately, our time isn't freezing. <laughs> Maybe you can talk and we can help because at uh, this time of day, it's pretty really it's, um, it's busy. You actually think this is a real who wants to be? You are welcome to the special edition of Who Wants to Be in Billionaire. My name is. This guy's real name is Apos, but he, he, he just simply, you know, um, uh, well, it's not his real name. His real name is A.Y. But he puts it, and then there's a subtitle, puts the name there. And, you know, if you're not familiar with the background, you happen on this on, on, a, on a YouTube, you actually think this guy is Apos. Uh, the Apos has become, you know, it's become like, um, like a metaphor. And different people use it for different purposes, trying as much as possible to imagine it into an ongoing 
viral narrative. And so he puts up what's now um, is now it reincarnates in this as a as a TV presenter. Um, unfortunately, we can't take more than that. So um, I don't know if I can. Oh yeah, so that's not working. Um, oh, let's try this again. You know, I don't know whether it's going to be better with this. But what I have here is a couple of YouTube links, you know, that would have given you a feel of how Atmos operates. Um, I think the traffic is very busy around the campus, so... Uh-oh. Looks like no luck. I have 15 minutes, so... Well, the YouTube links aren't working. Then, um, what it simply means that this aspect is not going to work for us. You know, the links that I have, I have a couple of um, a couple of links, and then the fascinating thing is that there is was um, there was apps. Um, if you read this, you see what um, what she says about the app was um, apps here. Um, he says, let me read uh, the last paragraph, um, the last, not the last paragraph, somewhere in between there, uh, the second page. In spite of this, I want to thank you for the great work you are doing in Nigeria. These days, it seems as if you are the only one working hard to make us forget our problems. Can you imagine that Nigeria was ranked 20th saddest country, and then there had been an earlier one that says they're the happiest people um, in the world? Uh, this, this is index. Uh, was don't mind them, Jerry. He tries to imitate this pigeon and this very peculiar way of writing. Um, everywhere I turn, I see another app was. So today, I have headache that only paracetamol from India can cure. On Facebook, I found original app was. App was the comedian. App was, app was uh, the comedian. And app was jokes. Space will not allow me to list the number of app bosses I found on Twitter and the spin offs from your vast business empire. Um, I think I should just shut that off. Sorry. Uh, this looks like it just might. I have 10 minutes, so it's, it's even of no use. So I'll just shut this and then uh, maybe. So it just presents, and then that's the point I wanted to make. Um, I found on Twitter and the spinners from your vast business empire, at boss apps for BlackBerry, at boss Android apps for Google Play, at boss jokes and the OV store, from the OV store, and so on. This proliferation of your brand reminds me of when my mother started, you know, she tries to interject some of those jokes. But this gives you a full range of the kind of multimedia formats that these uh, narratives exist in. And then um, I also have pulled out uh, some of these Twitter, I wanted to show you some of the Twitter feeds. Uh, it just might be possible to do that. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is one of the Twitter feeds. <coughs> At was joke, 247. Let's see what the first one says there. And then this is another format of it. You know, how short Twitter is. Uh, this has implications for how quickly this spreads because they are not longer narratives. And then if you put this against the background of a Nigerian writer and the really award-winning writer based in New York, um, Teju Cole, the author of Open Spaces, who is experimenting with writing a novel on Twitter you begin to have a sense of the Twitterverse and why there's already um, a DVD on it, Twitter Babes, you know, um, focusing on this universe, this new technology, these new modernities. And then, so the first one, teacher, I was, how was your night? I was response, I don't know, I was sleeping. And then he has, boss, um, I'll pay you 30,000 a month, and in three months, I'll raise it to 60,000. When would you like to start? At boss replies. In, in, <laughs> and, you know, you find all of this. So let me just get back. And this guy has over 250 of these. Of these uh, so with, with spaces like this, there's some kind of authorship, right? But it's actually deceptive because it might be also recycling the same joke that in other places and appropriating them with ownership. 
So the issues of complexity of authorship, you know, which uh, literary studies would uh, really find fascinating to examine. And then this is a app icon on Google Play. If you look at it, you'll find this, the one on the left. And then this is uh, one comic guy, you know, and the other one, the red-nosed um, comedian. And then this is a boss joke too for logo on Facebook. You can see Eddie Murphy there. On the other side, actually, is a, a very popular Nigerian um, comedian, Basket Mouth. This is a kind of you know modernity that is experimentation that is going on. How you know globalization is uh, you know destabilizing otherwise um, uh, specific spaces and bringing you know some kind of conversation that goes through the diaspora and through cyberspace. Um, I think I should return to my slide. Okay. And then, um, so, then this is another guy, you know, um, he calls himself Bobby Ogboma Akbos. Uh, it happens that some of the people who proliferate these Akbos um, narratives are, come from the Niger Delta area that we showed before because they are more comfortable with the language. And they also are more given to these kind of stories. And so, because they are too, the dominant characters in Akbos uh, narratives are Urobo people. Uh, Urobo is Shakiri, uh, which happens to be part of that ethnic group. And so um, 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 uh, the other characters that play with Abbas that you find in narratives are Chuko. And then there is yet another one from what they call the South-South of Nigeria, when it's divided into six geopolitical zones for purposes of leadership, political leadership. And then it's uh, from the southeastern part of the country, and then it's a Kaite. So you find the narratives with, uh, with a Kaite or Chuko, which is a very Urobo name. And then different people are using the same characters, writing stories around these characters, as if there's a single narrator for these stories. And then this is another fascinating link that I found. And then they, it's also operating within the print. Um, you know, this is a newspaper. I haven't been able to establish the veracity of this design, if it's actually. I know there's a newspaper called The Examiner. But this might, again, be just um, a stub by somebody who is so fascinated by the Atmos uh, phenomenon that he includes it into this. So there is, all you hear about our boss are, um, are all lies. And it's our boss that is actually, <laughs> that is actually saying that. You know? So um, it might be a comedian, like the one we saw, who is called our boss. And this newspaper, probably a local newspaper in Nigeria, is capitalizing on its popularity for reproduction. And then that's the one that we have, an online newspaper store, my handout, see bottom right corner. The bottom right corner there, um, SMS 1356 for Apple's jokes. The cost is 10 naira per day. So you find people signing up for this because um, it helps to relieve the tension, the stress of everyday life, especially in cities like Lagos with over 15 million people in a virtually landlocked um, environment. And so um, these are the kinds of things that people say, for example, why aren't Nigerians so angry given the kind of corruption that is going on? That they ought to be anarchy. I think these are some of the coping mechanisms, you know, is um, from a psychological point of view, a psychoanalytical point of view, is like some kind of um, escape, you know. Um, so this is the context, and then you have this there. And so she designs that. So at uh, is also a big business. And then there's uh, one other image, you know. Many of these images, apart from the one that I have shown, you have lost the, uh, the, 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 the producer's name, the authorship, so to speak. And so they don't come with any bylines, you know, it's not by anybody. They become just viral image, you know, and then it's difficult to begin to trace them. These are some of the complications in the research that I'm doing, you know, regard to having to go further with this into publication. Uh, what constitutes, you know, people's copyright and what's not. There are a whole lot of other spin-offs from this kind of a research. And then so that's our boss, um, ready for a caesarean section on a kite, <laughs> um, his partner. Note the lanterns, and then it's operating with a lantern. You can imagine how dangerous it is. But this actually does happen in Nigeria. People are operating with lanterns. Um, a mockery of Nigerians' energy crisis and healthcare sector. So this is some of the veiled political statements and social critique um, that is embedded in this um, um, format. And then that's that boss, and, and then teacher is the other character that you would find with that boss. There's so many. The, the first one we just read a short while ago from the Twitter is that boss's exchange with Twitter. And this is why it's such a hit with students, because it creates different classroom scenarios with our boss, you know, the maverick, uh, the trickster, and um, different kinds of negative things about our boss. Or if you may, sometimes extremely witty. 
And so I was on teacher, a recurrent cliche, you know, and I'm thinking about Mbotheko's um, essay on cliche and the kind of ways, you know, they are multiplied and circulated um, or motive in the narrative. So I have this on the Twitter, we can get it. And then that's the exchange here. There's a math class going on. I was, when is my next period? You see the naughty boy says, next month, ma. You know, making a reference to um, a different kind of period, you know, that women go through. You know, that's how crazy I was. And then you can see the class, uh, his students, you know, um, and then look at the gentleman by the corner there. Probably just wondering, this crazy I was. What would the teacher be asking him? And you find some of these, and then there's another scenario in class. He says, teacher, what is a, a baby lizard called? I was answers, Lizzie baby. You know, Lizzie is a name. And then he says, uh, baby. You know, you find some of these verbal play, you know, a whole lot of it, which is very characteristic of the language pigeon. And then there's a cartoon format, you know, uh, very much like Dennis the Menace. There are also people who are reconstructing their post narrative into cartoons. Please, sir, is it good to punish someone for what he did not do? And that's that was asking his teacher. And then the teacher answers, no, why did you ask? And that was answers, I did not do my assignment. So he doesn't have to be punished. <laughs> you know, he gets a guarantee before answering, which is logical. You know, you don't punish people for what they didn't do. And then, you know, he gets that. So you see this comic fashion, too. And then there's that boss squares of with Superman. This is another cartoon here, although the image is blurred because I've had to expand it. And then um, I find this really, really, you know, very, very important, this cartoon. I wish it were stronger, you know, uh, the resolution sharper. Because here it keys into the super, Superman and then uh, the superhero comic, which is a vast area that has been studied, you know, and uh, researched. Um, in the popular culture scholarship. And then look at, he says, who are you? I was, this is Abbas the Superman. And then the Superman asks him, Abbas, who are you? And he says, um, Abbas, you can see? Look at the, the man there. He's holding on to Superman, showing you know, an inversion of the power of Abbas, more like the biblical David and Goliath. Uh, but that was means business too, and I've already highlighted this. You know, um, one of the websites solicits send up was to 700 on your MTN. MTN is a mobile um, is a provider of uh, telephone services in Africa, perhaps the biggest, uh, for my freshest and funniest meal. And then of course you're going to be billed if you send it. So the guy is making money from this. And then the apps may be free, but not so the adverts. And a couple of adverts are show up. And then stand-up comedy is big business in Nigeria. Live shows, Nights of the Thousand Laughs, which is the most popular, and I have about 12 of them. They do them every year, and they hold very big shows, and they are recorded on DVD, and they are sold. And then you have them here, Nights of a Thousand Laughs. They're, they should be about 14 years now running, and then you have them. And then so on sale. And then some comedians, such as Ali Baba, one of the more popular ones, um, charge up to 1.5 million naira which is the equivalent of about $10,000 for a three-hour show. That is how big a business it is. So concluding, um, and I conclude by drawing attention um, to a specific aspect of the of digital media and why the importance of this kind of um, scholarship or this kind of research. And I quote uh, Gabriela Coleman again. The fact that digital media culturally matters is undeniable, but showing how, where, and why it matters is necessary to push against peculiar, peculiarly narrow presumptions about the, universi the universality of digital experience. Yeah, this is so important because as you have seen from this presentation, there are certain specificities of the cultural experience of this narrative format. Yes, you might think about you know, Little Jimmy, Little Johnny, or Dennis the Menace, or you might even have some other parallels, and I'd be very glad to hear um, any other parallels that you might have, because I'm trying to extend the comparative um, framework for this kind of cultural phenomenon. Um, I'd be very glad to get that kind of feedback. And then one final Abbas joke playing with digital modernity in everyday life. And this, you just wait for it. And then this also implicates the language, you know, the Wafi origins. That's the worry origins. This is worry for real. That's what it calls, um, you know, mom, Abbas, that fish and meat don't boil. Has it boiled? The fish and meat are cooking. And that was, yes, male. That's how mother is called in this specific, you know, um, worry area, male. You know, some of it, uh, metamorphosis, or rather, a fusion of the local language and English from mother. And then if you see the kind of so-called that mother, you know, offers, male, is, is so embracing, so touching, so loving, evoked in the name, male. 
and then mom, I beg, implicate, look at, look at now, see the words, English words run riot here. Having sometimes the same kind of meaning, but now being poeticized to carry a very localized kind of um, intention. Mom, I beg, implicate salt and maggi, add salt and maggi into the, into the cooking. You say, implicate salt and maggi. Attach oil, you know, in the very format that you think about an attachment. So you can see the whole play, the whole range of contemporary digital modernities at play. Um, attach oil, that's add oil, pepper, and sentence. Sentence the crayfish. Then involve the leaves, you know, further add leaves, you know, to it. After 10 minutes discharge, this is a, this is a crazy menu. It says, after 10 minutes discharge the pot, you know, from the fire. You they hear me so, are you hearing me? You should take down the pot. And then our boss answers, yes, Male. Sure. Male, this food go good go, go to download with Fufu. So he's going to download it, you know, finally eat with Fufu. You know, also using the language of, of, a, of a printing, of, um, of downloading, you know, of uh, internet usage. And then there's one more joke I'd like to share with you. Um, I think I'm up to, uh, time now. Our boss and bomb making, you know, um, which is also against the framework of the Boko Haram, um, crisis in Nigeria. Boko Haram are Islamic fundamentalists in northeastern Nigeria who are, you know, you know, very much um, they are terrorists, killing people and all of that. And then this has now joined the Akbos uh, narrative. Two boys, Habib, and I, I reproduce this exactly the way it is, showing you that somebody is doing this with a cell phone. Look at, you know, the choice of uh, Habib, short forms, Habib and Akbos. And I didn't, this is exactly the way it is. With, no, with a total disrespect for capitalization and so on and so forth. Two boys, Habib and Abbas, are making letter bombs. Habib, I'm not sure whether I put enough explosive in this envelope before I sealed it. Abbas, well, then open it and look. Habib, but if I open it, it will explode. Abbas, don't be stupid. It's not addressed to you. And then sometimes you have that rider at the bottom who is more stupid, you know, and it's part of the digital conversation. They invite, and then people begin to write in and join the conversation. At boss is this, at boss is, and then you see a whole lot of comments, you know, that follow that. Um, I thought I would be able to read a poem, but um, I wanted to play with this, and I'm going to skip that because I have also run out of time. And then this is an image that I found too very, very symbolic because at boss is a shadow. The writers of at boss you know, are shadows as far as, and then some of them claim authorship, which are questionable. But this guy uses this to promote his show. Akbos, a comedian, you know, we finally reveal himself to the world. And I think the process of revealing himself has begun with this presentation. Thank you very much. My name is Arpita, I'm quite short. Um, I'm in uh, the public history department uh, here at Carleton. Um, actually, I have two questions for you, mm -hmm. one of which is probably not very relevant. Um, by Maggie, in the, the first joke that you read out at the end there, do you mean like a, the sauce? Mm -hmm. Okay, just because that's something we have in India too, so that oh, kind of rung some bells yeah. for me. Um, but actually the entire culture of this kind of um, SMS jokes and stuff that get sent out daily is something that is really prevalent in India too. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if it's it's something that kind of crosses class lines because that's something I've noticed there mm -hmm. when you go to visit. So I was just curious about how okay. class plays a role in jokes. All right. Yeah, I think um, I did mention it um, <coughs> 
in my preface that this um, it crosses class lines. Um, the character of the presentations of the above narratives, you know, speaks for itself. Some are written, for example, um, well, I have some of those examples. They're, they're very international. There is a series of boss jokes that actually revolve around bosses and um, adventures in the US, in Saudi Arabia, and so on and so forth. Um, they may be imagined, but I also imagine that these are things written by Nigerians in the diaspora who are contributing to this cultural phenomenon. And then some of them, as I pointed out, are professors. I mean, my fascination with it, I could, you know, in one quiet moment, you know, just decide to throw one at buzz, at buzz that, you know, it crosses your mind. Although the comedians make it their staple, but through Blackberry especially, you know, um, people are able to share this. Um, any of you can produce an at-boss joke thinking in terms of the stock characters that exist. You know, you have a kaite, you can decide, oh, what has that boss done with a kaite today? Or with Ochuko, you know, his friend and so on and so forth. So they're different people. And then humor, you know, usually I think laughter is still the best medicine, no matter who you are. If you think about the shows that I talked about, um, who will be paying $10,000 for a three-hour show to a comedian? You can think about the class of people. Some of those shows attract as much as about um, 5, about 25,000 naira, which would be the equivalent of about $130 gate fee. So they are also very affluent people, but they are also very common people, ordinary people in everyday life. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's trans, it trans, 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 it crosses um, class. I'm going to do a follow up to that, if I may. So I'm going to mm -hmm. use that position to share and ask a question as a follow up. And I'm Chris Brown, I'm the director of the Institute. I mean, if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly here, this is a really fascinating idea. We have kind of the collective creation of a of a sense of Nigerian identity or in a certain way, or a, a sense of a Nigerian personality. Mm -hmm. Collectively, it's being created, which I find fascinating to think about. Because normally we think about these cultural products as being the product of an individual. Mm -hmm. And so that's interesting to me. But crossing class lines, because that was actually one of my first thoughts. Um, as you say, there's a huge number of people that are engaged in this collective production. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that's all the people who have access to the internet and cell phones and all the rest of it. But political scientist that I am, I immediately thought of all the people who are excluded from mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And so that's the equally large number of people in Nigeria, presumably lower class, poor, rural people who don't mm -hmm. have access to the internet mm -hmm. and to uh, YouTube and digital media in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Half the population. Mm -hmm. um, so to the extent that half the population is not part of this collective endeavor, how can you really say that it is crossing class lines? Because it's a large uh -huh. but still particular slice of society that is engaged in the process. So well, thank you curious. very much. I think um, that's, that's a very important question. Um, my take on it is that, which I didn't quite emphasize, is that it should be noted that these narratives exist both in the oral and the written form. They, they exist in different. So the oral form is something I haven't even discussed at all because it's difficult to apprehend the oral, oral nature of the narratives. Some of these are told, uh, post jokes told in pubs, uh, where people, you know, they have some of these uh, pubs now, um, just like the spot bar that you have here. But these ones, individuals set up and then begin to take small gate fees. And then wherever, there are different kinds of social spaces where they are shared. And then more so, if you think that they, they, they are, some of them are now, you know, they're on YouTube, and the cross-on rate, you know, smartphones, um, the pass-on rate of these, uh, of these narratives, you know, go transcend the media that I am dealing with. I think this is looking more like a very elitist presentation, you know, because the spaces, the social spaces include the, the transit buses, you know, and then the actually um, radio station, Wazobia, uh, which I, I had taken note of, and I discovered in the process of researching this that I can actually listen to Wazobia. is an online is online, but I was familiar with it in Nigeria, and so some of the jokes are being shared on radio, you know, and you know the the trot the the, um, the pavement radio in Africa, you know, has been so theorized is the easiest way people can access to information. Uh, there are, there are TV shows, and then the comedies actually stand up comedy. They don't need any books or as they memorize some of this. And so their post-narrative transcend, you know, the kinds of um, um, structures of power 
that you will find, say, like a cell phone, which many people cannot afford. And even if they could afford it, they might not be able to use it that much because there's energy crisis. They do not have power to recharge their phones. And they're charging stations, you know, where the kinds of things we take for granted. People go to um, charging stations, and then the, somebody sets up a charging station with, with a, a generating set and begins to charge about 50 naira, you know, for people to charge their phones for one hour. Um, so, yes, they're, they're, it does appear, because we talk about 90 million, which is roughly about half of the population, have um, mobile phones. And then we said about 40, you know, internet access and so on. And this is a very wretched kind of internet um, connectivity. So, yes, it's important to know that, but this is more than made up for, I believe, with the oral nature of this, or the transmission of these stories in line with oral tradition, uh, which was um, word of mouth, you know, was much of what... Um, the folklore, folk tales, and so on and so forth, you know, were translated. And this culture is still very much oral, uh, which is part of the larger work that I'm doing. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Suzanne Clausen. I'm in the history department here. I had a question as well about exclusion, but not around class, but ethnicity. And I don't know if this is the case at all, but you said that uh, Nigerian pidgin was the main language, and that seems to be located mainly around the Niger Delta area. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this is really a Nigerian-wide kind of discussion or discourse, or is it excluding people who don't speak Nigerian pidgin? I actually don't even know much about what Nigerian pidgin is. Maybe okay. you could tell me a little bit about that. And then my second question is um, kind of different. I mean, the humor is being used to make, at least in some cases, political commentary. And that, mm -hmm. that, that image of the, the Caesarean section is, to me, criticizing corruption and greed and terrible governance. And I'm wondering if there's other kinds of politics that are being critiqued. And the reason I asked that is I saw in one of the tweets, in the Twitter one, mm -hmm. um, there was a question, what kind of AIDS education can you tell me? And the answer was, uh, use different positions with the same women instead of the same position with different women. Mm -hmm. And I wondered is, you know, that's to me a critique potentially on promiscuity or, you know, um, uh, what's the word, uh, adultery or whatever. So are there kind of sexual or gender politics that mm -hmm. also get mm -hmm. critiqued in addition to the kind of high politics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, one of the downside of uh, the Abbas narratives is that they're very... Um, Sometimes they're very sexist. Sometimes they ridicule women. And then um, it was one of the one of the posers I threw up on the conversation on Facebook, and I got some of those responses. So yes, you know some of them. But again, there isn't that kind of consistency. You say he's a very complicated character. You know, there are instances where he speaks for women. You know, and then there are other instances. You know, where he also puts down women. You know, Ekaite Ekaite suffers so much in his hands. You know, Actos is always a man then. Yes. It's a male. Yes, the male name. And then uh, with regard to exclusion, possible exclusion with pidgin. Pidgin happens to be Nigerian's lingua franca. You know, it's a language widely spoken across the board. You know, um, if two Nigerians meet, if they are not people of um, the, of the, the elite, they're likely to be speaking pidgin. Um, and then there is also no consistency with the pidgin. You know, um, as we might find with the patois, um, say Jamaican or any of those ones. These ones, you know, sometimes. Rather than speaking the pidgin, the type that um, Abbas speaks you know, in the final section of the presentation, as I was concluding, you find sometimes broken English, which was a kind of thing we found in, you know, that you find on a, on a child market literature. Uh, broken English would be by people who are not so familiar with the pidgin, but who are also not very literate you know, with English language. Um, the pidgin, proper pidgin, are spoken by people who have uh, considerable control of English language but are not deploying it in a way that it serves their local purposes. And so Nigeria was colonized by the British. English is a language for business and instruction in schools generally in Nigeria. And so almost um, virtually most people speak English, but that's not to say there are so many other people in the rural areas who do not speak English at all, who need people to translate for them, especially the older generation. And so it, it doesn't quite exclude because it's a, it's a language of business, it's a language of social interaction. And then as it crosses borders across, um, across different um, media uh, spaces, media, media space, um, it begins to acquire different kinds of character. So the exclusion might even also include people in the upper class who are not familiar with pidgin. So you can see you know, an inversion of that kind of exclusion. 
that in some places, you know, people uh, who are brought up in places where they didn't have that much kind of access, ordinary everyday people can speak in pidgin that they will not hear. Because the kind of pidgin that our boss speaks in that final is a very localized, that can exclude, I can, I can bet you. There are even not so many Nigerians who will easily decode that pidgin because it says implicates, that's an English word. So sometimes you need to listen very carefully to its contextual situational use to be able to understand what it is all about. Thank you. My name is Mary, and I'm from Queen's University. Um, I wondered if, um, if you had found instances where a controversy arose in this domain, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's on a particular platform, mm -hmm. but transcended that domain and moved into a more serious discussion or a different forum where people actually could reveal their identities and engaged with an issue that was raised or caused a controversy in this more um, um, informal joke, yeah. you know, kind of discussion. Mm. So, for example, if... if um, if, if there was an act post joke mm -hmm. that raised a controversy and then was aired and discussed, mm -hmm. you know, either um, in a, but on a different forum where people could reveal their identities and engage with the issue that, um, that arose in that this other domain. Mm -hmm. Do, does that make sense? Yes, I you know, know. I, I would like to point out one that is, it might not be so closely tied to our boss, but it also happens to be one of the um, one of the celebrity representations of this kind of narrative, you know, the, the, the comedian called Basket Muff. You know, recently he cracked a joke around rape on Facebook, and it was an opera. In fact, there was mass mobilization, you know, um, activists on Facebook, on social media, Twitter, and the rest of them. And within, within hours, he was forced to retract it and apologize. And it didn't stop at that. People had already started a campaign, signature campaign, to get him to be pulled out from Glow, 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 Glow um, cell phones. Globacom. Globacom is one of the service providers for cell phones and so on. And he is the, um, one of the ambassadors. And the campaign was so strong that he issued a retraction and tried to issue a clarification. You know, it shows the power of the media and the power of these jokes. Regrettably, and this is the downside of the boss narratives, there isn't that kind of acute political consciousness that I would want to see invested in this. Um, a whole lot of it are uh, situational social um, interaction about that boss in the classroom. Sometimes, you know, um, uh, there are issues of uh, politics, and there are some of the themes. I actually have downloaded, you won't believe this, 64 pages of our boss jokes. And it's by no means comprehensive. Type set, 64 pages. As a matter of I see the possibility of doing something like what Thomas did with a life tones man upside down. But again, there are serious issues of copyright, possible copyright violations. Because it would be nice to see a compendium of boss jokes thematically arranged. I have been thinking about the possibility of that kind of project. But how are you going to identify? You're likely to run into trouble with people who have evidence that they, 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 they originated this that this is their intellectual property, even if it's part of you know, a communal narrative um, um, thread. Time for one more, or two minutes, please. Let me thank you again very much. That was a fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you guys for coming.